So keep your Bibles open there. Uh, some of you might be wondering, why are we not reading from Jeremiah 15? Well, I'm, I will be preaching for Jeremiah today, but I'll be preaching on that this afternoon. So we are continuing our Jeremiah uh, series. But I did want to start a new series, and I wanted to just use this Sunday morning to get it started. And I'm going to be preaching a series on soul winning. Okay, a, a series on soul winning. And so I've got five parts to this series. Let me just tell you what those five parts will be. And um, to, this morning, I'm going to be preaching on the importance of soul winning. Why is it important? Uh, part number two, I'm not sure, pr probably Thursday, I'll be preaching on the power of God unto salvation, which is the gospel. Okay. Uh, part number three, we'll be presenting the plan of salvation. So if you've never given somebody the gospel, you've never explained to someone how they can be saved, how can they be, how can they be sure about that? I want to give you uh, my plan or the plan that most people use, which is often the Romans road or some variation of the Romans road. And so I want to present that. Part four will be calling upon the name of the Lord. Why is it important? Why is it that we often like to pray with somebody at the end of the presentation? And part five will be on uh, that we are the ambassadors for Christ. We are the ambassadors for Christ. So that has to do with our conduct. If we're ambassadors, you know, how are we to conduct ourselves? How are we to behave ourselves when we go out there and preach the gospel? So it's going to be a five-part series. And we're going to be focused right now on the importance of soul winning. Why is it important? Why are we a soul winning church? Why is it, brethren, that when we started this church, I said, look, we will only start this church if we are out there soul winning. Okay, it's not just, you know, coming together and worshiping God and serving God. And that is important. That is the important uh, part of a church. But as we read there in Matthew 28, Jesus Christ has given us a great commission. If you look at Matthew 28, verse number 16, Matthew 28, verse 16. Unfortunately for many churches, now this portion, we know it as the great commission. You know, Christ is commissioning us to do a work. But in many churches many baptist churches many ifb churches it's known as the great omission it's missing it's missing from their church it's it's missing from the work that they do or they've replaced it with other forms of evangelism they've replaced that maybe we've we've given out tracts or they replaced it uh with with uh, inviting people to uh to a uh, Christmas, uh, you know, uh, show, or, or or people feel like, well, we're, we're doing things for the Lord because look at all these extra activities that we're doing. In fact, somebody recently uh, told us that our church, you know, we, we shouldn't be focused on soul winning. We do too much soul winning. I'm, I'm thinking about the church up in Queensland, actually, okay? But still, it's the same practice that we do here. And they said, you know, as a church, we ought to be feeding the poor, you know, finding the poor and giving them food. I'm thinking, what, what in the world? Now look, if we have poor people around us, we should be uh, generous and give. But listen, we live in Australia, we live in a Western country. You have to try really hard to be poor. In fact, if you're going to try really hard to be poor, you might as well try the effort to be poor and try to try really hard to work and provide for yourself. And, and what's the point of feeding someone's belly uh, week after week after week and then they die and they go to hell anyway? What was the point of that? Okay? More important is feeding people the spiritual food, feeding them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has left us the great commission there. Let's read it again. Matthew 28, verse number 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Some people misunderstand this, this portion of scripture here to be before Christ uh, went to heaven, before he ascended. Of course, this is before he ascended, okay? But this is not the, the time just before he ascended, okay? This is the time when, when Jesus Christ said, listen, come to Galilee, come to the mount. I'm going to show myself to you. This is the part where we see 500 people uh, saw Jesus at once. If you read about that in, I think it's in, in the book of Corinthians, okay? But look at verse number 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Brethren, who has all power in heaven and in earth? Jesus Christ. Okay? We often think that Jesus has all power in heaven. We, you know, we can kind of understand that. He sits on his throne. He's sitting on the right-hand side of the Father. Uh, but quite often we don't associate that Jesus Christ has all power on this earth. Okay? And so if Christ has given us a commission, he's given us a mission, he's telling us to do something, and he's just told us, I've got all power, then shouldn't we just go ahead out of faith 
and, and not doubt like some here, but just step out and say, well, Christ told us he's got all power. Therefore, I'm going to do the work that he's left me to do. Okay, so it's not something we ought to be afraid of. It's not something that we should shy away from. It's something that taps into the power of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Verse number 19. He says, go ye therefore. Now look, go ye, okay, is not invite the unsaved to church. It's not bring people into church. It's not, hey, uh, make church look like a, a club. Make it, you know, bring in the rock music, bring in the bands, bring in the singers, bring in the smoke machine, bring in the lights, bring in all the entertainment. And then, and then that's how uh, the unsaved are going to come to church. That's not how we do church. Church is for the saved. Church are for the believers. What we're instructed to do is to go ye therefore. We are commanded to leave our comforts, get outside of our comfort zone, get outside of our church, get outside of our homes, go and find these people. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now brethren, we've been blessed to teach in Australia. You know, we can go and, and give the gospel. We don't have to worry about our heads being chopped off. Okay, so listen, we have it quite well. There are other places in this world that if you go, therefore, and teach all nations, you are, you are truly putting your life at risk. We don't have that threat. So what's stopping us? What stops us? To preach the gospel. Teach all nations. Then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So when we look at the Great Commission, there are three parts to the Great Commission. Number one was teach all nations. Number two was baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Number three is teaching them to observe all things. Okay. Notice that teaching them to observe all things is separate from teach all nations. Okay, and there's a reason for that. Because the teaching of all nations is preaching the gospel. Okay? That's the part that we teach all nations. We go and preach the gospel. What did Jesus promise us if we do this? And lo, I am with you all way. Okay? Now notice it doesn't say I'm with you always. Okay? Now the King James Bible, you'll find sometimes the Bible uses the, the term all way or always. Okay? And always is, uh, means uh, you know, uh, for all time. Okay, but all way means all the way because he just finished saying teach all nations, right? And then he says, for I am with you all the way. I am with you all the way. So whatever way you go, whatever nation you find yourself in, brethren, Jesus Christ is there with you even unto the end of the world. If you just keep going to the end of the world, you know, you preach to every nation. Whatever nation you go to, Jesus Christ promises to be with you. And then he says, Amen. Okay, amen. All right, so this is true. Okay, this is the great commission that Jesus Christ has left us. Now, it is so important, brethren, that we complete this great commission because this is not the only time that Jesus left us these words. You know, this, this was the focus of Christ after his resurrection. After he completed the, the, the necessary sacrifice for our sins, the thing that he kept reminding his disciples of was the great commission. He does this five times in the Bible that I've found, at least. Okay, but let me show you another passage. Go to Mark 16, verse 14. Mark 16 and verse number 14. Mark 16, 14. This is again after his resurrection. Mark 16, 14. The Bible reads, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meats and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of hearts because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. There it is again. He says what? What was it before in Matthew 28? Go ye therefore. What does it say in Mark 16? Go ye into all the world. Now remember, Mark 28 started by saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And I said to you, that's preaching the gospel. Well, if you look at Mark 16, that makes it very clear. Verse number 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what that means, brethren? We don't, we don't have a choice. We can't say, well, I'll just preach the gospel to my family. I'll just preach the gospel to my children. I'll just preach the gospel to my friends. Should you preach the gospel to them? Yes. Okay? But Jesus Christ is telling us, preach the gospel to every creature. So you know what that tells us? Whenever we have an opportunity to preach the gospel, your family, your friends, your work colleagues, 
Okay, maybe some of you just come across at the shops. I don't know, you know, or you're act actively part of the soul winning program of this church and you're knocking the doors of your neighbors. Hey, that's every creature. Okay, we need to seek to knock every door. We need to seek to uh, every opportunity that opens itself up, brethren, to preach the gospel no matter what they look like. You know, there are times that I've knocked on someone's door and I'm like, wow, man, this guy comes out. He looks rough. He looks horrible. Oh, this guy's going to yell at me probably, right? I mean, this guy's not going to receive the gospel and he gets saved. You know, I mean, and there are times that I've knocked the door and I'm like, this person's going to get saved, right? They look, they look nice and, and gentle. It's like they're going to, you know, they're probably going to be, they're going to feel too rude to, to push me away and they don't get saved. And that's the point of preaching to every creature. You know, it's not based on our carnal thinking and, and you know, uh, uh, thoughts as to, you know, who may or may not get saved. It doesn't, you know, every creature deserves to hear the gospel. Amen. And who has he given the instruction to? To his believers. Okay, to his believers. And then it says in verse number 16, after it says preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized. So you can see that baptized now is the next step, right? Shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned. Can you please turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse number 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. I'm just trying to show you how often Jesus Christ gives us this command. All right? So first step is to preach the gospel. That's what I'm focused on right now. The second step is to get them baptized. The third step is to teach them all things. So we get them into the local church where they hear him preaching, you know, several times a week so they can grow in their knowledge and understanding of the Lord. But Acts chapter 1, verse number 6 now. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. Now this is the time before Christ ascends to heaven. Okay? Now listen, Jesus Christ... The mystery of godliness, God manifests in the flesh. He came 2,000 years ago for a purpose. He came as a babe in the manger. He came and he died for us. And these are going to be the last words of Jesus. Brethren, if, if you are going to have your last words, you know you're not going to be on this earth much longer. You have your final thing to say. What are you going to, what are you going to say? You know, if you've got your family around you, you've got those that are closest to you, around you, what are you going to say with your last words? Don't you think your last words are going to be something very important? Something very serious? Something that you don't want your loved ones to forget? These are my last words. Well, we're going to read the last words of Jesus Christ here in Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Listen, some of these people were so focused on, you know, on, on the earth. They were focused on the governments of this earth. They were so focused on, on how God's going to fix things around here. But there was a greater thing that Christ wanted to be focused on. There is a time, there is a time coming when Jesus Christ will restore his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. There's a time and place for that, brethren, okay? But Christ wants them to be focused on something else. Verse number 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Then he says this, But ye shall receive power. Hey, who has all power in heaven and in earth? Jesus Christ. And now he's telling his disciples, Ye shall receive power. Christ is going to give us his power. All right? He says this, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be, look at this, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. What are the last words of Jesus Christ? You're going to have power. If you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost indwelling in you. You have the power, brethren, to preach the gospel. That's why he's given you the Holy Ghost. One reason, so you can have the power to be a witness to, of Jesus Christ. In Jerusalem, that's like Sydney. In Judea, that would be like New South Wales. In Samaria, that would be like some other city or state of, of Australia. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. Whatever place you find yourself in, brethren, that it, God has given you the power to be a witness of Jesus Christ. He's given you the power to preach the gospel. And so, if you're somebody that is not actively preaching the gospel, listen, I'm not saying you have to be out there every week with a church program. Now, I would love it if everybody was doing that. I would love it, okay? 
But I understand that it's not realistic for everybody for whatever reason. But you have to use the opportunities that you have in your personal life to preach the gospel. And if you're, if you're only doing that maybe once a month or maybe once a year, let me tell you, you're not going to remember. You, you, you're you're going to become rusty. You're going to be ineffective in preaching the gospel. One of the great things about going every week, you know, you're keeping yourself sharp. You, 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 you keep learning because you're constantly uh, coming across different situations and you can learn and you can grow. And sometimes you're, 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 you're paired up with different people and you learn something from somebody. You learn something else from somebody else and you continue to refine and you continue to keep the gospel in, in, at the forefront of your mind. So if you ever come in, in a situation that you are unprepared to give the gospel, you're always so sharp enough to just be able to do it. Okay, That's one of the great advantages of being out there every week preaching the gospel but listen, you need to use the opportunity, you need to use the people that you know and give them the gospel, okay? You need to, and, and that's why, you know, uh, part number three is how to present the plan of salvation. If you've not done it for a long time or maybe you've never done it before, you know, I want you to be, you know, listening to at least, at least part three as to how to preach the gospel. But notice once again, Jesus Christ has given us the power to do it. You say, Pastor Kevin, I'm a little bit too shy. I understand, I'm shy too. Pastor Kevin, I'm a little timid. I, I understand, I'm timid too. You know, when I get out there and I, I knock that first door, there's butterflies in my stomach. All the time. All the time. And then you get in the rhythm of it. And you're, you're okay. But you're always that first door, you know. It's like, uh, you know, you're just getting ready uh, to, to do it. And, and you're kind of hoping that no one's home. <laughs> you're kind of hoping uh, that you're not, you're not just bombarded with this immediate uh, situation, right? But sometimes you knock the first door and that person gets saved. You know, it's, it's awesome actually when that happens, okay? Because you, you haven't gotten tired in your, in your walk or you haven't gotten tired, you know, just, just presenting. You know, it's a great thing when you're able to give the gospel the first time, the first door, and someone gets saved. Amen. Please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And as I said, you might say, well, I'm timid, I'm shy. Well, you know what? Did Jesus Christ give you the power or not? Didn't he just promise that he's given us the power to be a witness to Christ? Okay, so if, if you're saying, well, I just can't do it, you're denying the power that Christ has given you. Everybody can be an effective witness of Jesus Christ. Everybody. Okay, every safe, everybody, every saved person can be an effective, you know what I mean. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. 2 Corinthians... 5.17. Isabel, can you get me a, a cup of water? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.17. Because I grew up in church and we used to put money in the offering plates and quite often it would be like, well, this money is going to missionary here and that missionary there and we're taking up a special offering for this missionary here. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I believe that we should, you know, uh, help missionaries, those that are trying to get out there and preach the gospel, right? But I was left thinking growing up in church that, well, we're doing our part of preaching the gospel. You know, we're getting the, we're getting the uh, money out there to, to the missionary and, and they're doing the works of preaching the gospel. Okay. And so you grow up thinking that, well, my part is just to attend church. And there's a few people out there, just special people that, you know, God's put it in, in their hearts just... You know, and it's, just, it's just their burden to go out there and preach the gospel. You know, good for them. We'll send them money from time to time. And, you know, everything's good. That's, that's what I thought, okay? Until you read passages like 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17, which reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... Let me just stop there. If any man be in Christ. Are you in Christ? Are you saved? Okay, then this is about you. Okay, then it's about me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look at this. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Brethren, have you been reconciled to God, the Father, by Jesus Christ? Is that you? Okay, that's you. Let's keep going. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So if you're in Christ, if you've been reconciled to God through Christ, God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. You have a... What's ministry? To serve. Okay? You have... Oh, that's their ministry. It's the missionary's ministry to reconcile people to God. No. Anybody that is in Christ. Any man be in Christ. Okay? If you've been reconciled to God... God wants you to reconcile others to God. 
okay? You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 19. What's the, what's the ministry of reconciliation? Well, that's obvious. But then it says, to wit, that's to witness. You're a witness, remember? Christ said you'll be witnesses to, of me. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Oh, Pastor Kevin, I've got a good idea. How about we just use the tracks? You know, I'm a bit timid to give the gospel. We'll just put the tracks in the letterboxes. That's a good idea, right? That's my ministry. Just there in the letterboxes. I'll just hand them out in streets as people walk by. I'm just giving out the tracks. And, uh, you know, this is what, this is the, what the work, this is the work, isn't it? I, I'm fulfilling the Great Commission by doing this. No. Okay? What is it? Again, verse at the end of verse 19. And have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Brethren, the Great Commission is not just handing out pieces of paper. The Great Commission is opening your mouth and explaining with words how Christ has reconciled us to the Father. Okay? It's preaching the gospel boldly. It's using our mouths. And again, as I said, some churches have replaced the, the gospel being preached by the mouth to our neighbors. We've just put in tracks, put in papers in the letterbox. Can you find me a verse where Jesus Christ says, all right, here we go. I'm about to ascend up to heaven. Uh, here's all these papers. Go out there and find the letterboxes. Go and fill all, the, all these holes with, 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 with these gospel tracts. That's not the work that Christ has left us to do. You know, uh, look, am I against doing that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against it. In fact, many times when I go and knock a door, if I can't get into the house, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave one of our tracks in the letterbox. Okay? Well, you have no choice. You can't go in there. But listen, some churches have replaced preaching the gospel with tract distribution. That's not what Christ has left us to do. That's not the ministry of reconciliation. That's not using the words that Christ has given us to speak unto people and show them salvation, how they can be reconciled to God. I hope I'm showing you, brethren, just how important soul winning is. All right? And if you're saying, Pastor Kevin, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not soul winning. Well, you know what? You should feel a little bit uncomfortable. Right? I mean, you, 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 coming to church ought to be a, a place where you get challenged. You know, it's not a place where we just, oh, we're just comfortable here. I hope Pastor Kevin doesn't preach anything too rough around the edges. You know, because I, you know, I, I, you know, I just want to feel like I'm doing everything I need for God. Listen, we come to church to be changed. We come to church to be challenged. All of us have weaknesses. All of us have sins. All of us have challenges. And if you're one that's struggling to give the gospel, let this be a burden upon you this morning. Okay? Because you need to understand that this is what Christ expects from us. Okay? Uh, it's not just, oh, we, I want to do this as blessed about the church just to get our name out, just to, uh, you know, uh, advertise somehow, just to increase the numbers in the church. Listen, soul winning does not increase the numbers in the church. Okay? Have, I, have we had visitors come from it to, to our church through soul winning? We have had visitors come through here and up there. Guess what? They don't hang around. Okay, they don't hang around. You know, we don't go soul in. It's not like, oh man, this is how we're going to build a church. Again, if I wanted to build a church, we just have the rock band up here. That's it, okay? If that, if that was the point behind it. But brother, we go soul winning because that's what Christ has left us to do. It's the Great Commission, okay? This was the most important thing to Christ before he sent it up to heaven. Are you fulfilling what Christ has asked us to do? Can you please turn to Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 11. The next point that I have here, brethren, is that everything brings forth after its kind. Everything brings forth after its kind. Say, well, Pastor Kevin, if we just do enough tract distribution, if we just go out there and hand out Bibles, and uh, we just, I don't know, what else do people do? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If we just, if we just you know, just publish the Bibles, we get them out there as much as possible, surely people are just going to get saved. Okay? That is not... Listen, all the way... I'm, I'm turning to Genesis 1 because I want to show you a very foundational doctrine all the way in the book of Genesis that everything produces after its own kind. Okay? Genesis 1, 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed 
after his kind, and the tree yielding fruits whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Brethren, what did God say was good here? That everything would bring forth after its own kind. Notice that a seed is necessary. Things that bring forth seed, that seed needs to be planted in order for more to grow, in order for more to multiply. This is a very basic doctrine all the way there in Genesis 1. Everything brings forth after its kind. You know, when we, when we see the Jehovah's Witnesses out there knocking the doors, and we see the Mormons going out there preaching their false gospels, okay? Guess what they're doing? They're bringing forth after their own kind. JWs are making more JWs. Mormons are making more Mormons. Where are the Baptists? Everything brings forth after its own kind. You say, oh, well, I'm not a Baptist, I'm saved. Okay, where are the saved people? Okay, where are the believers? Going out there and bringing forth after their own kind. Look at verse number 21, same chapter. Genesis 1, 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Listen, evolution is stupid. Whales will bring forth whales. You know, uh... A bird will bring forth birds. Dogs will bring forth birds. Uh, birds. I messed up there. Dogs will bring forth dogs. Everything brings forth after its own kind. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creep upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Everything brings forth up. How many times does Jesus Christ have to tell us this in Genesis 1 for us to understand this concept? Very basic. Okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Okay? So if, if God is telling Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply, what are they going to bring forth if they're fruitful and multiply? Aren't they going to bring forth after their kind? Aren't human beings going to bring forth more human beings? Of course. That's what we read about in the Bible, right? Cain and Abel. And here's the thing, brethren. Here's what you need to understand. This is true in a physical sense. Okay, you need the seed to bring forth after its kind. Okay, in the physical sense, this makes sense. But it also is true in the spiritual realm. It also is true in the spiritual realm. Okay, only a spiritual man, only a saved man can bring forth another saved man. Okay, after his kind. Proverbs 11 verse 30, I'll just read it to you. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. If you've won souls, brethren, that point in time, God says about you, that man or that woman was wise. Man, that'd be awesome for God to say that about us. You've seen somebody saved. You've seen someone believe the gospel, call upon the name of the Lord, and now they're sure of going to heaven. You're wise. You're a wise man. Well done. Okay? But don't forget what it said before. The fruits of the righteous. You know, when the righteous, when the saved bring forth fruit, guess what fruit that's going to be? Other believers. You bring forth after your own kind. It said that the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. Hey, what do trees do? Don't they bring after their own kind? If you have an apple tree, it's going to produce fruit of apples. And you take the seed of that apple and you plant that seed, it's going to grow another apple tree and that's going to produce more fruit. Okay, more, more apples. It's the same thing. We've been given the tree of life. Okay, we have everlasting life and we're righteous and we need to bring forth after our kind, which is the winning of souls. People do not get saved unless somebody, a spiritual man, is there to teach them God's word. Please go to Acts chapter 8. I know a lot of you guys know this passage, but let's go there anyway. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts 28. Sorry, Acts chapter 8. Acts 8. Acts chapter 8, verse number 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We have the story of Philip, who was a deacon at this point in time. Later on, he was known as 
Philip the Evangelist. But you can see here, even serving as a deacon, Philip was given the work to preach the gospel. All right. It says here, and the angel, verse number 26, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So you see this, this man of Ethiopia, this eunuch, okay? A man of great authority, a man of great riches. He, he's in charge of all the treasures, okay, of, of uh, the queen there of the Ethiopians. This is a, a powerful man. This is a rich man. You would say he's an educated man, surely. He's not a buffoon, okay? He's a wise man. He wants, even comes to Jerusalem to worship. He knows that the God of Israel is the right God. I mean, this guy is, is, is you know... He knows what he's doing, okay? Look at verse number 28. Was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, the prophet, that's Isaiah, okay? So this man's reading the book of Isaiah. Hey, somehow he got a copy, maybe in Jerusalem, okay? Hey, maybe he had a gospel tract there with, with Isaiah. I don't think that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big gospel tract if you had all of Isaiah reading there, okay? But listen, he's reading. Is he, is he understanding what he reads? Is he going to get saved because someone gave him a Bible? Is he going to get saved because someone gave him a tract? This is a wise man. This is a great man. What is this? Look at verse number 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So Philip says to the Ethiopian, Do you understand what you're reading? You're there reading Isaiah. You're going page after page after page. Do you, do you understand what you're reading? What does he say? Verse number 31. And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Hey, this is a powerful man. This is a wise man. He all, all understands the God of Israel is the God, the one true God. He, he starts, oh, yeah, I've got a Bible. I've got the book of Isaiah. I'm going to learn of God. God sent Philip, who was a saved man. Philip asked, do you know what you're reading? He goes, how can I understand? I need a man to guide me. Brethren, it's not just giving out papers. Okay? They're going to read it. Guess what? They're not going to understand. They're going to need a man to guide them. They're going to need a believer to guide them. Why would the Holy Spirit take Philip you know, and perform some miracle and transport him here if it, was, if it was so easy to get saved just by reading a tract or a Bible? Okay, It's not possible. How can I accept a man should guide me? This is in the Bible for a reason. Okay. You can pray, you know, oh, Lord, please, uh, you know, have a lot of Australians saved and, and Lord, uh, please get the gospel. But listen, if you're not going out there and doing the work, then you're missing the point. God needs a man. God needs a woman. God needs the children to get out there and explain the gospel message. Can you please turn to Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10, verse number 12. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 12. Brethren, I don't want to pastor a church that is not fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, if our church ever just stops doing it, okay? Now, I'm not saying we put it on pause, okay? Because we had a period there with COVID-19 and, you know, you could only have so many people at a house or whatever with the, when the restrictions came into place. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking where we completely drop the ball. Where we completely say, you know what, this is no longer part of our, our ministry Maybe one day we grow to 100, 200 people. Who knows what the future holds? We say, we've got enough people here. Oh, we don't need to do any. Yeah, let's just focus on, on the people that we have. Let's make sure we don't lose anyone here. Let's make sure everyone's comfortable. We don't need to get out there anymore and preach. When you drop the ball, brethren, that's a major problem. Major problem. We'll get to that soon. But Romans chapter 10, verse number 12. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 12. Just in case Acts chapter 8 was not enough to convince you that a man needs to guide an unbeliever, because you might say, well, that's just a story. That was just the Ethiopian eunuch, right? No. Romans chapter 10, verse 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
That's wonderful. Okay, this part was a part four. Calling upon the name of the Lord, right? We're, we're going to get to that point. That's important, right? If you call upon the name of the Lord, you're promised to be saved. So that's the end part of giving the gospel. But when you read verse number 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So it says, look, how can someone call on Jesus and be saved unless they first believe? Yeah. Okay. But say, okay, let's, okay, let's get them to believe. Okay, how do we get them to believe? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Heard, heard. What's heard? From your ears. Listen, in order for you to believe, you have to hear God's word, don't you? Say, well, let's get them to hear God's word, right? Let's just, I don't know, let's just get megaphones and just broadcast. You know, some people do that. They just get in the middle of a street. Let's just broadcast loud the message of salvation. They're going to hear it. Is that how God wants us to operate? You know, just use blow horns and, and signs. And that's what some people do. They think that's what God has left us to do, right? Let's keep going. It says, And how shall they hear without a preacher? Oh, so how are they going to hear to believe, to call upon the Lord? They need a preacher. You say, well, pastor, you're the preacher. You're preaching right now. That's your job, pastor. Now we saw that it's the ministry of reconciliation to all that are in Christ. Amen. You know, preaching is not just behind a pulpit. The most important preaching that goes on is everyone that gets out there into the community preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, I believe in women preachers. Yes, I believe in children preachers. Okay, not at church behind the pulpit, but preaching the most important message, the gospel of salvation to the lost. We've all been called to be preachers. That's how they hear the word. And when they hear the word, that's when they can believe. And when they believe, that's when they can call upon the name of the Lord. Look at verse number 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Brethren, you know what? As zealous as you may be, you may yourself get yourself out there preaching the gospel but we know our failings. And if we're not being provoked, if we're not being pushed, it's very likely that that's going to drop, that we're not going to do it. You need to be sent. Why are you preaching this sermon this morning, Pastor Kevin? So I can send you. So you can get motivated. So I can get motivated. You know when the people in church go and soul winning, I get motivated? Because I'm like, you know what? I'm the pastor. I better get out there and do some soul winning as well. You know, and, 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 and you know, this is what Christ has left us to do. You know, so we need a good church that will send us. Let's get out there. Let's preach the gospel so people can hear. And when they hear, they can believe. And when they believe, they can call upon them, Lord. And when they call upon them, Lord, they shall be saved. That's how it works. The person needs a preacher. The person needs somebody to explain the good news of salvation to them. So don't ever think, brethren, that we can just find some other method of soul winning and, and feel good. Oh man, I gave out paper today. That doesn't help anybody unless you're willing to open your mouth, proclaim the good news of salvation, be a preacher, you know, of the gospel. What verse am I up to, brethren? 15. 15. I didn't finish it. Hey. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. You know, when you go out there and you preach the gospel of peace, peace, the reconciliation, the peace that we can have with God through Christ, God says, you have beautiful feet. That's a beautiful person. That person's doing a beautiful work. He's doing what I've left him to do. Look at verse number 16. And they, <clears throat> and, uh, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say unto you, but I, sorry, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. What did Jesus Christ promise us? That he's going to be with us to the end of the world. You know what we're being taught here? That the, the, the early believers have already done the work. They've already gone out throughout the whole world okay even isaiah said this so even in the old testament times the gospel went out throughout the whole world in the early church times here the gospel went out throughout the whole world and guess what we're left to do the brethren say so, well it's already done yeah you know what yeah okay it was done many generations ago many centuries ago those people are long gone 
That means there's a new group of people, there's a new generation. There are new generations all the time that require for the gospel to be spread throughout the whole world. That work has been given to us. And we're focused right here in Sydney. We're focused specifically here in Fairfield and in Australia. And eventually, one day, we'll get out there doing some missions conferences or mission trips and, and getting the gospel out there in other places in this world. All right? I mean, there are already members in this church that have already seen people saved, preach the gospel in other nations and gotten people saved. Praise God. We're, we're, we're already kind of doing that, okay? But you can see here that our sound needs to go throughout the whole world. You know, Jesus Christ has promised us wherever we find ourselves in this world, he'll be with us. We have his power to preach the gospel. We have the power to see souls saved. Please turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 10. Revelation 1.10 There is a danger in not being a soul winning church. There is a danger. All right? And I don't think we're even close to this danger. <laughs> okay? Because uh, we have several men, you know, several people that get out there on a weekly basis and, you know, they're, they're serving the Lord. They know this is what God has left us to do. I'm not, I'm not concerned about this. Okay? But when you let down your guard... Okay, why is it that churches fail? They let down their guard. They think everything is okay, right? No, we need to preach the whole counsel of God. And we need to remind ourselves just how important this job is. In Revelation 1.10, it says, John speaking, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Who's saying these words? That's Jesus, right? And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Let's just stop there for a moment. So when he sees Jesus Christ, he sees him, and also he sees seven golden candlesticks candlesticks you say man what is the seven golden candlesticks the book of revelation is so hard to understand right we'll drop down to verse number 20 same chapter verse number 20 the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels angel means messenger this is like the pastor right the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So what are the candlesticks? What do they represent? They represent the church. Okay? We saw seven candlesticks that represented the seven churches by which this letter was distributed in the first century. Okay? But now, let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4. We saw that one of the churches was the church of Ephesus. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4, please. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ has a lot of positive things to say about the church of Ephesus. But there's one major component that they're missing. In Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, people stop there and they, they focus on that. Oh, man, we should never leave our first love. Absolutely, you're right. We should never leave our first love. You know, the very first commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength, okay? So, yeah, you know, let's, let's make sure that we come to church not for personalities, not for any other reason, but to give God love. But notice that when you leave the first love, there's a consequence to that. There's something that follows through by that. Verse number five, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, so thou have fallen away from that first love, look, and repent and do the first works. So you notice there that leaving the first love has to do with leaving the first works. When we think about the first works, what are we thinking about here? It, do we need to work our way to salvation? No, salvation is not by works. Okay? What is the most important work that Christ has left us to do before he ascended up to heaven? What was the work? It was the Great Commission. You know what? If a church leaves the first works, 
If a church leaves the Great Commission, if the church is no longer soul winning, you've left your first love. How can you say you love Jesus when you're not even preaching His gospel? He died for you. He died for this lost world. That's what He did. That was His great sacrifice. Oh, I don't want to tell anybody about that. Uh, but I love God. No, you don't. No, you don't. How can you love Christ? How can you say that and you're, you're too afraid to give people the gospel? It doesn't make any sense. Okay? So, the first works, if we're not doing the first works as a church, brethren, we're going to lose our love for God. Okay? What else did it say there? Uh, it says, uh, And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Look at this. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So we see a few things there. You lose a love for Christ, you're going to lose a love for soul winning, meaning you're going to lose the candlestick. God's going to remove the church, and we're no longer going to be a church, brethren, if we don't do the Great Commission. Okay? You say, well, I know lots of churches that are still running today, Pastor Kevin. They don't do any soul winning. Okay, they, and they, look, they're praising God, they're singing, and oh, look, they're continuing strong, and they've got so many members, but they're not so winning, Pastor Kevin. And they haven't been so winning since the very beginning. They've not been so winning for 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years. Didn't Jesus say that it's going to remove the candlestick? Yeah. You know what it is? It's just a social club. Yep. That's all it is. It's just a whole bunch of people getting together, and they're not a candlestick, they're not a light to Jesus Christ. Okay? They've left their first love. They're getting together. They think they're doing God. They're pleasing God. God's not pleased. They're no longer operating as a church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're a church. They're a congregation. They're a social club. They're coming together and making each other feel comfortable and happy. But listen, they're not a true church of Christ if they're not doing the Great Commission. It's so important that we do this, brethren. Otherwise, expect God to remove the candlestick. Expect God to no longer use us to be a light in this community if we drop the soul winning. Can you please turn to uh, Acts 17, verse number 1? Acts 17, verse number 1. I'm, I'm at the end now. Conclusion. The conclusion. I hope. I just want to drive home to you, brethren, the importance of soul winning. Okay? And, you know, when we say soul winning, we, just that term, soul winning, we think about somebody getting saved. And so sometimes we think that if we don't soul win, we've been unsuccessful. Okay? Listen, not everybody's going to be one. Okay. The important part, we call it soul winning, okay? But really, we should just call it preaching the gospel. You preach the gospel, nobody gets saved, brethren. You're still effective. You're still alive for Jesus Christ. Christ can look down and say, look, you love me. This church loves me because you're preaching the gospel even if nobody's getting saved. Are there weeks that nobody's going to get saved? It happens all the time. There are days, but that oh, it doesn't work now. Let's stop. No, it's going to work. You know, it's going to work. There are, there are great days and you might see several people get saved. We saw three people get saved in one day. Was it three, brother? Three people get saved in one day. Sometimes we don't even see a single person get saved and we have the whole church maybe going out. You know, it, it doesn't matter. You, if you're doing the work, you're doing the Great Commission. Amen. Okay? You're doing what Christ has left us to do. And it's important, brethren. Look at Acts 17, verse number 1. The conclusion here. It says, Now, when they had passed through... Amphipolis and Apollo, Apollonia, that's talking about Paul and Silas, I'll show you soon. They came to Thessalonica, where, uh, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this is Jesus whom I preach unto you, oh, sorry, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So what is Paul doing when he gets to Thessalonica? He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying this was needful. This is how we get saved. Look at verse number 4. And some of them believed. Praise God. You believe? What does that mean? You're saved. Yeah? So he's effective by getting some of them to believe. And then it says, and consorted with Paul and Silas. I just want to show you that Paul and Silas are doing this work together. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of a chief women, not a few. So many believed. Okay, some of them believed. Many, a great multitude of Greeks. Many of the chief women, not a few. That means a lot of chief women got saved. And so this is the beginning of the Thessalonica church. 
Okay? When you read First and Second Thessalonians, when you read about that church, you know that it was Paul and Silas that went there preaching the gospel, got a whole bunch of people saved, and they started a local church in that area. All right? So why are you telling us that? Well, now go to First Thessalonians for me, please. First Thessalonians chapter one and verse number one. First Thessalonians chapter one and verse number one. As you know, Paul is only one man. He didn't have a very great. Uh, he didn't have a great multitude of people that was with him on his missionary journeys. And so quite often he couldn't visit all these churches that he had started. So he would have to write epistles, as you guys know. All right. And so uh, First Thessalonians is an epistle that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 1. Look at this. Paul, so there's Paul, and Silvanus. Silvanus is um, the same guy, sorry, as Silas. Silvanus and Silas is the same guy. It's like Paul he had two names, Saul and Paul. You know, I think some people believe that Silvanus is the Latin form of the Greek name Silas. It's the same guy. Okay? Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please go to chapter 2 now, verse number 19. So I just want to show you how Paul and Silas started this church. Now, Paul and Silas and Timotheus are writing this epistle to the church, right? Verse number 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 19. Because you might say, well, Pastor Kevin, you know, soul winning requires a lot of work, and it does require a lot of work. I'm, I'm timid and I'm shy. Do I really need to do this? You don't really need to do it. You, you, you will live with, you know, you will still go to heaven, okay? But it is a work that Christ has left us to do. And what I want to show you here, look at verse 19, let's read it. Paul and Silas say about this church, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? He says, look, Reverend, you know what gives me joy? You know what gives me a crown of rejoicing? So, oh man, must be, must be the mansions and the big cars and must be, all, you know, I don't, I don't know. What is it? He says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. What am I saying, brethren? If you want glory, if you want joy, if you want a crown of rejoicing when Jesus Christ comes back at his coming, you know what you're going to need to do? You need to get a whole bunch of people saved. Okay? Because when Christ comes back and these people of Thessalonica that got saved, that believed the gospel, and they're caught up into, into the, the clouds with, with Paul and Silas, and, and they see them in the presence of Jesus Christ, they're going to be able to rejoice. They're going to have a crown of rejoicing. They're going to be filled with joy and say, look at all these people that were able to come to heaven because of our work. You know what, brethren? If you've had people saved, that's going to be your crown of rejoicing in heaven. Your crown of rejoicing. How many people have you gotten saved? You know what? The more people you get saved, guess what? There's going to be more rejoicing. There's going to be greater joy. You say, soul winning's not for me, Pastor Kevin. You're going to miss out on this crown of rejoicing. You're going to miss out on this great joy at the coming of Jesus Christ if you did not go out there and give the gospel to the lost and see people saved. Brethren, I want us, when Christ comes back, we're called Blessed Hope Baptist Church for a reason. Christ coming. I want that to be the best day we've ever had. The best day that we've ever experienced. Okay, today's my 17 years wedding anniversary. Hey, getting married was the best day of my life, but there's going to be a greater day coming. Okay, and I know that's when Christ comes back and I can rejoice with all the souls that got saved. I want the same for you. Soul winning is important. Yes, there's blood, sweat, and tears when you go out soul winning. Yes, it requires effort. Okay, yes, it's going to cost you fuel in the car to find a location to preach the gospel. But I promise you this, when Christ comes back, it's going to be the best day of your life if you do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to miss out on the crown of rejoicing. Okay? Soul winning is important. Preaching the gospel is important. Let's pray.